unfortunately we don't um, um, we don't have Doug with us tonight to take minutes. Does anybody want to? You know, if people will help me facilitate, I'll take minutes tonight. It's, um, I, I'm not going to be leading most of the discussion, so I think I can possibly do it. I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> All right. Is Aiden is still the chair? Yes. He, he is. is an assistant tonight, so. No, no, but you can, you can preside, though. You can oh, preside. okay. I, don't, I forget to do that. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we have a lot of public here. Um, we do have a very full agenda, uh, but, but I, I must say public comment period. So does anybody want to say something to start off with? Sharon. Well, I, I know that support of the um, resolution in favor of carbon pollution pricing is going to come up. And I just want to remind the many people who've been on this commission for a while that in, I think it's August of 2015, you, I brought a resolution about supporting carbon pollution pricing. And it was 100% re-indu, you know, uh, voted in favor of. And I asked the commission to bring it to city council, but Bill said, no, it would be more effective for me to do it. And my, I finally got around to finding a city councilor to uh, encouraging Elisa, who's my city councilor, to do it. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody of that. And hopefully, it won't take up much of your agenda. Hey, thank you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Lily, Lily Lombard, 39 Monroe Street. I'm here with many other citizens and maybe they can all stand up who support uh, the resolution calling for carbon pricing in Northampton, for the city of Northampton to pass a resolution encouraging the state to pass carbon pricing bill. So there's many, many of us and everyone can say their own piece, but in case any of you are shy, here's your chance. So I will just reiterate what Senator uh, Ed Markey said at Town Hall when he spoke a couple of months ago. He said that because we're paralyzed at the national level, we have to push as much as we can at the state to forward climate saving legislation. So this is our best tool. And, um, and it's something that Northampton can use strategically to put pressure on the state to encourage our, um, our own state representatives and senators. They're uh, co-sponsoring, well at least Peter Cocott is co-sponsoring the House version of the bill. Um, but he has definitely, in a meeting just this week with us, said that, that there needs to be political will built around this and a lot of demonstration of support. So that's why we're here and that's why this resolution is in front of you. And it's just as, as common sense as it comes um, and I hope that you will support it. Thank you. My name is Adele Franks. I have uh, mentioned to this commission several times that we have a, a group from Climate Action Now that is working on the 100% renewables campaign. And um, a bunch of us are here tonight. So I just wanted to say that these are some of the people that um, are interested in working with you on increasing energy efficiency and renewable energy generation locally. Thanks. My name is Susan Voss. I'm at 89 Ridgewood Terrace. I won't repeat what was already said, but I'll just add to it that I think this is a really important resolution to pass, that Northampton can be a leader. One thing that I can add about this legislation is that I think it's been very thoughtful in terms of um, taking care of people who are less well off and trying to come up with smart ways to accomplish that. And, I like that it's sort of vaguely written in the resolution so that the state has some control over what they do, but I think people are being really thoughtful about it. I'm a member of an indivisible group called Two Degrees, and there's a lot of members of that group very much behind us. I'm also a member of the new group in Northampton called Mothers Out Front. There's a few of us from that here, and there's also several Northampton citizens on that that would like to see this move forward. Anybody else? Okay, wonderful. And since Lily had you guys all stand, I think we know where you stand. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so uh, I would uh, take a motion to approve the minutes of the March 2nd uh, meeting. So moved. Any comments? Discussion? All in favor? Everybody? Yeah. Okay. This is the problem with uh, facilitator taking minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe you just think of it as a nice healthy pause. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> um, okay, great. In that case, we're going to move right on to our um, uh, first uh, uh, big item. Um, How do you guys pronounce the name? Essence? Isis. 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 Um, an opportunity for thermal imaging, which has come to a number of the communities in the Pioneer Valley. Um, I think maybe I will leave it at that and let you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I will just say that um, I first heard about this when Senator Rosenberg invited um, uh, Mayor Narkowitz and a few other uh, folks to his office one day, and Mayor asked me to join him, and that's when I first heard about it. You guys have heard about it because I have brought it up to the commission. Um, uh, in the past, I can't remember if I had handouts or not, um, uh, and, and there was an initial discussion started about how do you use, how do you possibly use these thermal images of, um, of, uh, of people's homes, and um, uh, now we actually have the opportunity to speak with, are you guys wait enough? No, we're not from East We're, we're not East Coast. We're not East Coast. We're not East Coast. Yeah, we'll explain. I'm going to let you guys um, I just make one comment. So there, yes. there's a the Springfield pilot um, infrared project through Mass Save a few years ago. Right. So um, and we're, I think we all remember that. Our folks were on the commission, so you could put it in context of that similarities, differences. Right. Okay. Yeah. So to be honest, I don't actually know exactly that much about it yet. I'm going to speak to someone next week. But first of all, my name is Uli Nagel. This is my friend and colleague Bob Voss. And um, this whole thing started with basically a philanthropist down in Long Meadow being very interested in climate change and talking to me about it and saying to me, um, oh, shall we go there? Is that how it works? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, basically saying to me, you know, how can I make a difference? So we did a bunch of research. He's well known in the Pioneer Valley for other kind of projects he's involved with. We did a bunch of research. And in that research, we came to across this technology by a company called ESES that was started in MIT and now is a startup basically that came up with this thermal imaging technology that is similar to that project six, six or four years ago, I'm not sure, but it's way, way, way more sophisticated. So we showed the images to someone who was part of that and they said, oh, this is a whole other league. Um, and we can explain a little bit more about that later. So. Um, Basically, we realized when we, when we started to work with this company pretty quickly that just the images themselves, just thermal imaging and showing homeowners one more thing that kind of tries to convince them to make changes is not really going to do it. So the way we've been thinking about the whole project right now with, with several towns, 10 towns in the, in the Piney Valley is that how can we use them and leverage them in a way that's integrated with a whole bunch of other, either things that are already you know, happening in towns, like Chris told us about some of the things we've been thinking about, or how how could it like um, amplify, you know, um, ideas that people already have. And the, the purpose of this meeting is in a way to just explain it to you a little bit, and then also speak together about potential uses and how how we can crack this nut of energy efficiency potentially using these images as part of the mix. And Bob is going to take you through. So I'll just give you a little, we don't want to go too much into the technology because we want to focus on what Uli just said, how can we use it. But to give you enough, I mean, have you all been exposed at all to the, the ESS and how it works? A little bit? I'll just do it really brief because we want to get into the, the dialogue more than anything else. So the objective of this study is we want to, we're finding out very quickly that, as Uli said, the images themselves are not a silver bullet. And I had a long conversation with a guy down at the big utility in Pennsylvania called Pico. They work with ESS and he said it's, it's a great tool, it's not the silver bullet, it has to be part of a, a whole integrated strategy to get people motivated. You can show them the images, they get excited, but they still don't make a choice to uh, make changes, retrofit their houses for more energy efficiency. So we're, that's one reason we want to work with the towns closely, because 
For example, Chris, we had one of our most fruitful conversations with Chris, finding out everything that people in Northampton, all of you working on this in Northampton, have learned from the various things that you've tried. So that's why this partnership is really important to us. Now the scope of this project is, <clears throat> he says his scan is 100,000 homes in 10 towns that I'll show you in a minute. And then they're going to select, because the data, the data processing is, that's the most intensive part of this, it's very advanced, it's costly to do the data processing. They're only gonna pull out the lower 25% for this pilot project. So if a town were to choose ultimately to use this technology, you could scan the whole town. <clears throat> and then we're gonna, they're gonna do the analysis and produce the images and the reports, which we'll show you. And then the next step, that's, the, that's kind of the unknown. How do we leverage these? If we just mail them to the homeowners, will that really ultimately have a big impact? We want to figure out a way of creating a buzz. I mean, we use the word marketing up here, a marketing campaign, but basically somehow, and this is where we need input, we need to find out how can we have these reports and images have the most impact ultimately in terms of motivating people to retrofit their homes. <clears throat> so, and then the other thing that, that when they analyze all this data, they provide a login for town officials to be able to look at the data. They don't own the data. The data is owned by ESES. It doesn't belong. It's not public domain data, just to make that clear. And then, but the town officials are able to access this web portal, so you can click on any of the, on this map, and you can pull up the data for a given home. So it can help the town figure out what's the best strategy for motivating people to make their homes more energy efficient. So here are the towns, here are the 10 towns that have said they want to be part of this. We've, the towns have been scanned. They had to be scanned while the weather was still cold because it's the contrast between the outdoor temperature and the indoor temperature that allows you to get the image. And now here's a, just to give you a brief overview of the technology. These guys at MIT developed this very fancy, doesn't look very advanced, but it's a very, very sophisticated camera on top of a car and they drive down the street at night and one of the benefits is, is you can scan a lot of houses in a short amount of time unlike where you go in and do an assessment house by house and and the, the way they process the data they have multiple angles on each house and they end up processing the data to get a very high resolution very informative image which I'll show you in a minute right there so that's what that's what the thermal image looks like and it takes a lot of data processing to get to that point from all the data they collect <coughs> the areas that are orange are where there's a lot of heat loss and they're able to they merge the thermal imaging data with demographic data with uh, weather data all kinds of data gets merged in and they're able to produce a report which you're going to see in a minute but one thing they can do is they can actually label the image and show you where the maximum heat loss is. So it's like having a, well it is, it's a thermal image of your house. <clears throat> and then, you can't really see that unfortunately, but you can see there are little, the little bubbles there. They identify where the most effective measures are to, to increase the energy efficiency of your house and they give you an estimate of how much money you would save per year and then how long the payoff is to pay for the expense of doing the upgrade. And then you get a report, which you, we have some handouts here, we don't have enough for everybody. It's a two page report that gives you a summary of your house, <clears throat> what are the measures you can take, what do they recommend, what are the recommended measures, a number to call is one of the things we need to figure out. Having a hotline number you call so you can get guided through the next steps including getting financing, all the financing options for your town, for example, through MassSafe. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the homeowner to make the choice to go ahead and do this work. And as any of you know, like Chris knows, you can get, a lot of people get their houses assessed, only a small percentage end up doing the work. 
So that's what we're trying to, that's the nut that Dooley said we're trying to crack. That's the second page of the report. <coughs> and then there's an overall map on that portal that I was talking about, that web portal that's available to, you know, to people who have the login. And you can see the red buildings are the least efficient, blue are the most efficient. This happens to be Cambridge, Mass, where MIT is. <coughs> he said, ironically, a lot of the buildings at MIT were red. <laughs> <coughs> and then, and you can, that's what a screen looks like on this web portal. You can see the overall map of the town, then click in and look at any one building that's been scanned. So it's a lot of useful data. And they have found from um, some studies they've done, they actually hired a company down in Pennsylvania to do a study that these images do have a big impact on homeowners when they see them. It does motivate them when they say, oh my god, is that what my house looks like? Am I really losing that much heat? But they still have to take that next step. <coughs> so that's the basic technology. Does anybody have any questions about that? Anything more you want to know about it? Good. I guess. I know it's more sophisticated, but in essence, in essence, is the information gained far different or from what people get with the CET or whatever? <coughs> I think it's more, it's more sophisticated, it's more detailed, but you still, it's a very good question, because in the end, let's say you identify a house like the one I showed you with a lot of heat loss, and, and then the next, if that person is then motivated to take the next step, they still have to come in and do the full assessment, walk through your house, figure out the square footage, where the insulation would go, what kind of walls do you have, and all that. But this helps you, because you can scan so many homes at once, it helps you identify high target homes where you to get the most potential for saving energy. Right. Yeah. No, I was going to say the same thing. Because you can look like 100,000 homes took about four weeks to scan. So you get a lot of homes done in a very short time, very cheaply. But um, you have to go back and do what Bob said. Yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily that the lift gives you that much more information, but it does give you a lot of information in one fell swoop. Yeah, we, I read one comparison. There was, um, it, was a, it was in another state, I forget where. And they compared the scan that was done by the equivalent to CET. <clears throat> and these scans, and they said, for, as an example, these were much more effective at picking up walls that were not insulated, mm. highlighting walls that were not insulated, needed insulation. They were pretty much equal in terms of the roofs, but for some reason, mm. they were more effective at identifying uh, walls that you know around the house that needed insulation. So, you mentioned that there's demographic data associated with this. Would that include heating fuel source and whether the house was air conditioned or not? I believe so. I think it varies from town to town depending on what data they can. You'd have to be able get. to get that data. You have, they have to be able to get whatever data they get. I could, I could yeah. show you it. Yeah. yeah. And usually they work with utilities, so they would yeah. have all that information. In this case, we decided to sidestep the utilities because mm -hmm. Senator Rosenberg's idea was that if we get towns behind this and we actually show that this works, we have a leverage towards the utilities mm -hmm. to say, hey, listen, this is something people really respond to. We did this, that, and the other thing. And why don't you know you have to do this too? Mm -hmm. That's the long term, actually, hopefully, yeah. the outcome of this whole project. Yeah. Um, I should go first. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came up at our last meeting was about uh, people's sense of privacy and invasion of privacy. Yeah. And I'm wondering what the prep, the marketing preparation before the this is done, what what it looks like, and how yeah, you, you kind of that alleviate that? some yeah. of that. Yeah, I mean the company itself, before they even really became a company, because they put millions of dollars into this stuff, they really covered the basis in terms of legality. So they worked with lawyers that worked with Google on the Street View situation. So they basically covered the fact that there's no one that can actually complain about the images being taken. Now that giving, being said, there's no way you can see anything inside the home, you know, and so, so far I think we've had in all the scanning, we've had one call that we've heard about of somebody saying, you know, what's happening, and this is, uh, you know, this is creepy, I don't want my house to be scanned. But generally, also in, in Bob's here, yeah, you want to talk to that? Bob? Yeah, we, we, because we thought this might come up, and it does, just about every time we talk to it comes up. And there, um, Navigant is a consulting group down in Pennsylvania, they had an independent, the utility that was working with ESES, had an independent 
consulting company come in and do a, um, you know, where they interviewed customers and they talked to customers and they did a, <clears throat> like a little, it would, I think they interviewed some and they had meetings with some just to find out how customers felt about it. <clears throat> and they didn't have a whole lot of the, the 10 they interviewed, none of them reacted negatively, nor did they get, I spoke to this guy down there that heads the whole, he's a, the equivalent to Chris for this big, huge utility. He's been doing it for years. He said it was not an issue at all. And they did a much bigger project than this. And they didn't get one person that complained about it. It wasn't and Northampton, though, was it? It wasn't <laughs> Northampton. That's a good point. We're finding that out. Yeah, and right. you know what happened in Cambridge? They did this once. They had someone walk around with a camera and leave the pictures on people's front porches, and people freaked out. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah. and out of that, actually, that was one of the reasons why the utilities have been able to say, no, 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 we don't want to go anywhere near this because this always turns out to be an issue. This is kind of a little bit on a different scale, plus nobody else will see anybody's home. So, you know, the reports that you're seeing, they're tailor-made for each single homeowner. So nobody else gets to see that picture other than themselves. But you're right, it's always like a little bit of a, you know, um, it's a perception issue. It's a perception right. thing. Yeah. Exactly. Like, each, 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 if I could just expand on that and claim jump you a little bit, Aiden, mm -hmm. if I can. Yeah. The, um, the police departments actually use thermal imaging, for instance, to determine grow houses. Yeah. Now, of course, marijuana is, is now legal, but grow houses are not legal. Uh, there would be, and the concern is the, the government aggregation of data that's relative to uh, thermal emissions that could also indicate illegal activity. Yeah. And as such, so it's, <coughs> you can't, you're right, legally, if you reflect light or heat and it's able to be documented, there's, that's actually, there are no rules governing that, but the fact is, is that there could be subsequent resistance by community members. Of course. I, I'm not saying that we have this prolific amount of grow houses in the community. I don't know of any. <laughs> but but, no but <laughs> the fact is, is that there could, I, I think there is a civil libertarian heightened sensitivity That's in the right. community that, yeah. might, that might respond in such a way that yeah. maybe, you, maybe we may even trump Cambridge in that respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And that, that was my only comment. Hang on, yeah, sure. I was going to on to that about, excuse me, about city information that the city um, has is public, is public in the public domain. And I don't think we could hold something right. against a, a Freedom of Information Act request if we had the data. But so. you wouldn't know. See, that's the thing I was, the point I made earlier is that you don't. We don't own it. You don't own the data. So that that's that firewall. Does it? Yeah, right. But the privacy issue is very real. That's funny you mentioned the thing about the row houses because just yesterday we heard from somebody that there was a constitutional ruling. It yeah. was ruled that this was on, but it was in the context of police using it to bust somebody. With, with, without, without prior knowledge. Without so prior knowledge. Exactly. They and were. they took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of right. the, the person growing the pot. Yeah. Because they said for that reason, yeah. Because the police were just going through neighborhoods and, and, yeah. and thermal, doing thermal images of houses and found right. the hot houses and then, then processed warrants. Right. So. But that's why I think there has to be, we talked about having, you know, doing, just being very transparent and doing whatever the, the pre publicity would be so that people are receptive to this. They realize you can't see in the windows, the data is not going to be shared with anybody, et cetera, et cetera. But, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that was one of the things that we talked about in the, you know, preparation for this meeting. It's like, could this data be used to work around that? You know, I mean, the thing is, the scanning happened. Right. You know, it's actually done. So now, if we get 25 per, uh, percent um, of those of that data as a report now, if there is a hot house, it's going to show up because it's going to be bad. Right. So we're looking for the 25 percent worst houses. You know, so. Um, the question is like, is that th there would probably be a way to deal with it, even in the run-up to the whole thing, because you, you literally get to choose, you know, who, who you send the report to. Mm -hmm. But is there another way to, to work around it and still make use of the data and not run into trouble? That's kind of part of the exploration here, I think, also. Right. 
I want to get to Aiden's question. Yeah, so yeah. I, I just first want to say, it's so, I think it's so cool that Harold Greenstone is still interested in energy efficiency. My first job out of college was working for him on the oh, energy right. efficiency program. Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that the attic installation? Uh, yeah, energy. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, we should talk. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, it's really great that he's looking to kind of sideset the utilities. Yeah. I mean, that old program was all about leveraging them, which is kind of proven what need, needs to happen. Mm. Yeah. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is that the utilities hold all the, all the money. And if you want to play, you want to leverage that money, you yeah, have like to Mass join Save, their Save. program. Yeah, yeah. Mass Save being the, yeah. the program, yeah. So the challenge that comes up here in other similar efforts is, you know, you go and do your own, you know, uh, project based on building science, what actually that home needs, right? And, and then it, it doesn't mash with the utility program. So for instance, basement insulation isn't a viable incentivized measure in Mass Save, and that's why you know houses can ten times go through Mass Save in Northampton, but they're still bleeding heat through their basement because it's not a viable measure. It's not covered. Yeah, no spray foam is covered at all. Uh -huh. So you know the the risk here is that if this isn't thought through from soup to you know from beginning to end, and the end being implementation, exactly, then it's just a confusing marketing thing that isn't going to go anywhere. Exactly right. So yeah. So yeah, so, so my recommendation is that if, if you're going to partner with communities that, and it's all about implementation, like that's your success is based on how many people follow up, mm -hmm. that you bring together the implementation contractors that can do this work and find a way that they have an incentive to work with you because it's going to be easier for them to get these projects right. and, and serve these Easy. people. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So it's but it's you know it's cool technology you know this this is this is a marketing tool right here exactly. it's, it's another thing of having people think about energy efficiency of their home right. since they last paid their bill or they last had a cocktail party exactly. whatever it was it's another thing and I'm I work in this industry and I'm always skeptical when you see terms like you will save this here's your dollar amount of course it varies by market it varies by age of the home the complexity the asbestos you know buildings are really complicated and a lot of the the worst performers in Northampton are very complicated houses. So it's it's useful in context of an implementation strategy and that's I think it's great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well that's so, what so yeah, yeah. I mean you brought up three points, um, just going backwards. So um, the idea with the home performance contractors. Mm -hmm. Are you with Cozy Homes by any chance? I used to be. Oh yeah. okay, I have yeah. Point, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's definitely an avenue we're pursuing. We've spoken to three or four so far, and okay. they're very excited about it, um, and want to help. And would be ideal to take someone from front to end, you know, without them having to go to a first mass save and then the contract. Blah, 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 blah. So we want to make it like really super simple: one phone number, one person that takes them through the whole thing, one contractor they're dealing with, you know. So um, that's. That's a really good idea, I think. And then <coughs> the other thing you said about the basement, um, certain issues not being covered. Um, this project deals only with attic and walls. So I think those two are covered, right, by mass set programs. Uh, yeah, sure. limited ways, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Your, um, your, your image actually shows, or yeah. one of the images actually shows basement and, and recommends um, uh, spray foam. It shows the, yeah, they call them. Mm -hmm. It's either in the slideshow yeah. or on the this, handout. This one is uh, on the Vancouver. So this is for Canada. You know, they, yeah, they, this is a Vancouver yeah. sheet, but it just shows the basement. Right, exactly. And I'm not sure if that's okay. because it's Canada. Or, yeah. Ask about that, because I live out in the Berkshires, and we, I had CET come in mm -hmm. when we moved in last September, and they did quite a bit of work in the basement. They insulated some crawl spaces, they put spray foam all around the... Yeah, and house too. Yeah, we got a lot of work done down the basement, and that was covered. With Berkshire gas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, if it's considered air sealing, then it is, it's a... Oh, I see, it was air sealing versus... Yeah, okay. Oh, so no, I just wanted to address yeah, okay. this, this last point was to do with the, with the money, the estimates. I think yeah. that's true, that is a weak spot. The, one of the data that they do put into the whole mix of, you have that, did you have that slide? Oh, yeah, yeah. That shows all yeah. the data that they're putting in there. Um, it has to do with contractor rates it's hard in, the, to in read. the area. It's very hard to it read. has to do with, um, you know, the, the kind of incentives that Mass Saves provide. So that's all pieces that they feed into this to come up with those numbers. But um, <coughs> you are right in this navigant. Uh, evaluation, they did say that that's not always completely accurate. So one of the things we actually want to see is are we even going to put it in in that form because that's up to us. We could edit those reports in a way 
that that uh, you know doesn't do such a hard sell on that kind of level. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the ideas we heard is that it could be useful, and this um, gentleman down Pico spoke of, if one of these uh, contractors, <coughs> you know, working with Mass State showed up at the door and they had the report in hand. Now, you know, the homeowner's gotten the report, made the call, the contractor comes, and they have the report to help them interpret it. And then they do their assessment, and they also help them uh, figure out the financing options that are available. That that could be the way to get go from the thermal image mm -hmm. to implementation to yeah. and financing. If you bring your own financing to this, that's another huge value add. If we bring in addition to the mass save, yeah, saying. separate from. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you know a little bit about that. Well, yeah. we're just starting to explore that because that's a whole other yeah. animal. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. We should do good. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got more experience really than we do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it, what strikes me as unique about this technology is the big data aspect of it. I mean, mm -hmm. if you take one home at a time, it, it's really no different than a CDT audit in the Mass mm -hmm. Save program. Yeah. But the fact that you've got 100,000 yeah, homes, exactly. to me suggests that one lesson we learned from our Solarize program was there's a very strong bandwagon effect when mm -hmm. people start to see their neighbors doing something. Yeah. And for that program in particular, it said, you know, if you're part of the first wave, you'll get a, a discount because of the economy of scale and sort of buyer's club aspect of it. If there was a way to leverage the big data to create buyer's clubs, create financing programs, create contractor groupings, um, to me that would overcome the barrier that you have when you onesie twosie yeah. individual yeah, yeah. homeowners. Chris, you saw that. Yeah, I actually want to um, mention that is uh, right along the lines of something that Northampton is looking at implementing for uh, the renewable and, and encouraging people to, to uh, look at renewable thermal mm -hmm. and when we do that program we're going to do it along with energy efficiency mm -hmm. um, this is the whole renewable thermal outreach piece that I've been um, bringing up with you folks but so perhaps we, the, you know, those two programs could mesh yes exactly I mean one of the ideas that we have um, for this technology would be um, uh, you know based on a website to encourage people to come in to start have like Solarize did they had workshops with the installers right. This would be workshops with the contractors who would put in the high pressure, you know, the uh, air source heat pumps. And I'd love to have like the high pressure, I mean, the, uh, home performance contractors there as well. So that if you did get one of these forms, and that, in my mind, everybody was gonna get one, but now I hear it's the lowest 25%. But, you know, you, it's then delivered to you in the context of people who uh, have experience. It can help you interpret it. And on top of that, in Northampton, because we're looking at our building assessor's database and building uh, building inspector's database and assessor database, trying to identify, um, you know, really categorize houses. Um, well, we could, uh, in, I can imagine before the workshop even begins, knowing who's gonna be there, we've identified the six people who own capes and the four people who own split levels. And we know that they're gonna have common problems in their house. So, you know, at the workshop, you try to get those people together, start trying to compare their notes um, with a contractor in hand to start giving us some guidance. And then the homeowners would then have to, you know, reach out to the contractors to actually do any work. Um, but that whole, uh, so that is kind of a direction that we're aiming in right now. It's, uh, you know, it's and with kind this of data track. analysis, you can do that homework in advance ahead of the workshop. Though. That's the idea, mm -hmm. right? And with the support from another, I mean, the, the, high, uh, the air source heat pumps, we have a grant of services. So we actually have another, another um, mm -hmm. firm that can help us do some stuff. I'm not sure if that would cover this, but uh, um, that's the kind of direction we're heading. It's, it's yeah. good mention. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Is the does data show that the the, the bottom twenty five percent or the houses that are less efficient are necessarily owned by people who can't afford to make them more efficient, or is it not related to income level? Depends what data you're looking at. If you're just looking at you know what, what is the lowest twenty five, it can't just be the amount of orange in the picture, right? Well, what? I think it has to do with which homes leak the most energy. We, yeah, yeah, the least definitely. efficient. The least efficient homes, the 25. Just from the thermal image. The least efficient homes, right. So if someone has a wood stove, they're going to be giving off a lot more heat. Well, I think it's including the data, but basically, yeah, it's a good question, actually. I'm not totally, totally sure. I better not say too much about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm partly asking because I'm just curious if um, we're identifying kind of the people who have the least efficient homes 
are they the people who can least afford to actually good sink money into the improvements, even though I know they're going to be incentives and so forth? And, and that just brings up a question for me, you know, how do we make this a more comprehensive approach so that we're actually enabling people to take advantage of the incentives? Right. So I mean, I, I would imagine there's a correlation there, definitely. I don't know if it's totally you know, parallel, but yeah, I, I, and the other thing is also that, um, that if you're under a certain level of income, MassSafe doesn't actually um, catch you. You go to the next level, which has to do with the community action councils. Mm -hmm. So we would have to actually figure out, and that's where the census data is going to be part of this, you know, who lives there and what group of, of what kind of help would they be eligible for. So that's definitely part of the yeah, work. Also focusing on larger uh, multi-unit systems, um, to, you know, to apprise landlords, for instance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They haven't they haven't figured out how to do multi <coughs> buildings that's quite a, yet. Okay. So they don't know where the, which room belongs to what apartment and stuff. So that's yeah something that right. And I, but there, I mean, Northampton has a pretty high inventory of two-family homes and the like. So. It seems to me they'd be able to assess yeah, that fairly easily. The uh, multiple apartment buildings might be a little trickier, although you can get a more holistic sense of the building and the, the heat loss there as opposed to individual apartments. I mean, there may be someone in that apartment that leaves their windows open because it's paid, right. paid for the heat's right. paid for. Yeah. And right. That would probably register, but if the building in the main looks like it's pretty solid then. Mm. But I mean, it, it speaks more to what Lisa was saying, which is a concern about um, of, of targeting people who can least afford, um, and and creating sort of a, a class a class <coughs> uh, separation here. And and you know we can give these folks, and they may not even own the home, but if they do own their home, we can give them, give them this report. And they may not have the means or even any sense of how to, how they can address that, and just sort of contributes to their sense of woe. But yeah. Well, that's why I think <clears throat> what we're thinking is that because they bring in some of the kind of data to allow you to identify those homes, that when you <clears throat> when you go to that home or when you have that, they call that number, the financing options that they're being presented with are, for example, you're helping them, uh, right? You know, get get the financing that they can given their low yeah, income. Yeah, to get, I mean, to be aware that that CAC has some uh, some some subsidies that can help. Yeah. Although we'll see how long that lasts, but uh, yeah, I know. Um, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> what was I asking? In, as part of that conversation, I mean, the city is looking at a lot of demographic data and geographic data in order to try to identify which houses would kind of match up to put together programs to help specific homeowners. Yeah. Um, would we be able to work with you guys to pick the lower twenty-five percent? I mean, because that we could kind of address these types of things. We could be looking at. You know, neighborhood level, there's certain income, the census will tell you a certain certain block level that, you know, the income level is in that area. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much, you know, a homeowner's income, but it's a, you know, this is a lower income part of, of the community versus upper income. And there are other parameters as well. Rental, is it a, uh, is it a rental unit? Is it a home, um, owner occupied? Um, those kind of, that kind of data the city would have. Um, right, so, yeah. you know, so we, yeah. we could, yeah. That's a good question. We need to ask him that exactly because I think, uh, yeah, that's a question to what information flows into the 25%. I think that's very good. I'll have to find out. So you're saying basically, could you pick the 25 yes, yes, yep. You're saying, could you pick the 25%? Have input. Uh, have input into that, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have one more stupid question. You said you were not here representing ESIS. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I didn't make that clear. <laughs> so I'm basically uh, Harold Grinspoon's Pilates instructor, but I've always like, been an activist and, and kind of really interested in climate change. So I started to talk to him about it. And at some point he caught fire. He heard some presentation somewhere and suddenly went, whoa. And um, so he had basically told me, look, you're very passionate about this. Why don't you find out any way I can make a difference? So that's where the whole research started. And then we found ESA, started to work together. And this whole thing started to grow real fast. And, money was involved because this is a gift to the towns, you know, obviously. 
and, and so then we needed somebody who has some business acumen, that's where Bob came in. <laughs> so we're basically the Harold Grinspoon Charitable <coughs> Foundation Energy LLC. <laughs> it's actually it. an entity that was created. Yeah, right. But it's a spin-off of the Harold Grinspoon Charitable Foundation. Yeah. Right. But we needed something. When we signed the contract with ESAS, we had to be something. No. But we haven't, we want to work on getting a name. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, this, anyone has any good ideas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pilot project, you know, right. we just call it a pilot project. Right here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what is ESIS's role in all this? They've already done the scanning. Are they and trying to market this technology? Or? Well, all they are. That's there. Yeah. yeah. That they are doing that, but they're yeah. actually, they, they've been. Beyond these towns. They're oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk to the DOER. Vancouver, so that's that report you have there. Yeah. But I th I'm finding yeah. that we have a different angle on it, and actually I'm getting really good. Like this pipeline, you know, the gas moratorium that you have here, right? That also could play into this whole thing. And, and uh, uh, there was a woman from the pipeline awareness group I talked to the other day, Katie Eisenman, do you know her? Well? And, and she said, wow, you know, maybe we could leverage this. So we're coming more from a like, grassroots level. Mm -hmm. They went Just straight. Just today that they're lifting it within the next two years, though. No. They are. Well, 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 Just today well, they decided. Once they build a new pipeline. Yeah. 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 They're building. It's a whole new pipeline. But that's so just that's Northampton and Hadley? Yeah. East Hampton. East, 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 East Hampton. Amherst yeah. still could so possibly have a moratorium. Something that's just got decided? Mm. Yeah, oh, just okay. announced today. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So, yeah. Just yeah. kidding. There's plenty of room in the place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Bob, I have a question. Um, uh, I mean, you guys have shown up a slide of Cambridge showing all the, you know. The yeah. Site. Is that going to be available for the uh, participating towns? I mean, I know you're going to be giving this data for only 25% of the houses, but uh, not, not this one here. Yeah, it's, it's the you uh, want that map. That one, right, yes. right. Yeah. Um, that one available, and I'm just actually questioning, um, yeah, and as part of that, you know, I'm really curious, how do you find the lower 25% without processing all of them? Yeah. Well, well that's, that's, yeah, that's a little tricky thing. Right. They, they, no. they process, they can find the lower 25% of the houses that they, the 100,000 they span. So, yeah, well, would, would that be available? Um, I believe that, so. Yeah, I right there would be a fantastic. The map, the map yeah. of the of your twenty. Yeah, yeah. Um, not twenty five percent of the, the hundred percent. It would be a map no. of just the twenty. No, I'm not talking about because that's corollary. the scope of this project is such that we didn't we didn't pay for the processing. A lot of the expense is not in the scanning; it's in the processing of the data. <clears throat> because it's a pilot project, we're just going with the twenty five percent. Oh, so this sort of okay. map wouldn't be part of it. Yeah, I think, no, as far as I know, you'll get a map like that, but it won't be the whole town. It'll only be, oh, it'll only be because they're not okay. going to do the data processing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Most of the work is after they've done the scanning. They've got terabytes of data, and then they have to process it all. Okay. And they're going to just pull out 25% to do the full, the full Monty that leads to the image in the report. A very practical question. So Northampton has been scanned. Mm -hmm. Were particular areas chosen? How how was it mapped out? They mapped it by, by single family homes that are owner occupied, whatever data they have to to to. to and all that. parts of the city, right. throughout the whole city. That's right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> my house is leaking like my eyes be glowing orange. Okay. <laughs> Isn't he off now? Should be cold. Now. What's that? Should be cold now. Be it is cold now. now. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to scan it again. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure that uh, this conversation, actually, where are my notes here? That um, um, that we kind of, ex we, we kind of, and we've been having a discussion on how to use the data. Yeah. So, if any questions on how to use the data, and um, and if you guys have any, you know, want to be able to exhaust your your questions for um, uh, these folks here. Uh, I can't so answer them, they'll write to you. <laughs> the last five, yeah, five, five minutes spotted for this Just to discussion. follow up to your question, Chris, if the 25% on a map like that could be made available, is it open access to the extent that we could put it on our uh, city website and allow residents to find their homes? I, I, their I'm not so sure, because then you would, I know that there needs to be a firewall that's the, between that's, you owning the data. I was just going to say, that would be the elimination of that firewall. <coughs> yeah. allow anyone to see anyone else's home. Right. right. That, that's right. where people might get a little sweet. Right. Yeah, I can see this kind of a map as being a great planning tool to exactly. help come up with programs yeah. that can help people. Okay. But, you know, it, it, you really want it to be a planning tool and, and not just yeah. a public. Yeah. So taking a step back, then it could be made available to the city. 
kept within the cities? Yeah, well, the, the, the web portal has that, you know, you get a login and a okay. password for, I think, three, up to three users right. in each town. So the city would be responsible for putting out the message you may be receiving in the coming well, that's to that, and then boom, you Very good question, because that's one of the things we're working in our conversations with the different towns, finding out how, how do you, sorry, how, how we've gotten different ideas. Some towns have said, well, the report should come from the Grinspoon Foundation, not the town, but we'd like to put a letter insert in there. Just saying that, you know, we're excited about participating in this pilot study, whatever, you know, that so the town would have some role in the messaging. We've also talked a lot about the pre, pre-marketing, getting a little buzz going. So when people get a report, they're more motivated to even open it up and act on it. Because, you know, it could land in the mail, and they found out in, in that study they did, you know, that Navigate study, a lot of people never even opened them up. It, it, to the Scott's point about the Solarize Northampton, which was enormously successful, mm -hmm. and that did a lot of pre-selling and education. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I, and I think you know, what Chris has just described, I mean, we, we um, this meshes nicely with, with research that we wanted to do and programs and outreach programs that we wanted to do. Yeah. So it might be better coming from the city, as it were, as opposed to. I mean, how do you feel as a city doing that kind of thing, working together to figure out the best way to message it so people are more likely to open the reports and respond? Well, well I'm, I'm not prepared to speak for the city because it's, I would never yeah, dare. Yeah, that's right. You guys I would never dare. <laughs> but the city, but, but, but yeah, yeah, right. the, um, I, I, I think, and I won't even speak for Chris, but I believe that this. It'd be more. It'd probably be better if we control the outreach and the, and and, and it be branded as a city project as yeah. opposed to. Yeah. Uh, again, Northampton's tendencies might be a little anxious if uh, either a five hundred one c three or an uh, individual corporate entity started notifying yeah. them. They some people might get a little squeamish about yeah. that. So yeah, yeah. better come from the government. So yeah. well, at least the government has an ability for people to give input into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right, and then you could say stop it if they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, that. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting in terms of that because we just had a press put out a press release, for instance, a whole bunch of places in the valley saying this is happening, and you know, because we had this idea it would help for the next few months while while this uh, report making is, is in progress to to create a buzz, you know, to get people kind of somehow into the mindset. Oh, there's there's thermal imaging going on, and they'll tell me this and that. So do you think that would interfere? Because what you just no, said. No, I don't think it would. No. I don't think it would work at cross purposes. Okay. It's just that I think once we do the aggregation of data and we, and we suss out who we're going to contact, that's probably more. Uh, that should be on us ultimately yeah. than, than okay. other agencies. And Chris, internally, do you have a vision for how we're going to figure this out? Is this something that we, as a commission, are doing? Is it coming out of your office? What? How is this going to? Oh. Okay, well, it um, depends. I mean, I, I, I'm not developing any ideas specifically directly just for this. I mean, there are other ideas, energy efficiency outreach, renewable thermal outreach, that I am, that would, this would be a useful tool for. It. And, um, uh, you know, I have talked to the Energy Commission about putting together a steering committee um, to help guide that process. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've asked the mayor's office to talk to him about that as well. You know, I'm not sure how appropriate it is for a steering committee to be guiding the city staff person. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where that should sit. Mm -hmm. But I think there probably would be a very good idea to have some kind of a policy setting group, however we want to define it, whether it's inside the Energy Commission or separate and related to the Energy Commission, um, you know, to kind of provide some, um, uh, just some, some guidance, oversight, communication with the neighborhoods. To, uh, you know, so uh, to make sure that, that that communication happens, it's not defined yet. Um, I'm trying to work on it, um, and maybe the next meeting I bring it back up with the energy commission. See, you, know, you guys respond again. Yeah. yeah, I think in context, you know, this is great timing because of what Chris mentioned. We've been thinking a lot about energy efficiency outreach yeah. and how to target yeah. people who will implement improvements mm -hmm. and the challenges of that. And we've talked to a company, a startup in Boston, about using public data and creating kind of these remote curve readings and um, talked a lot about data, just like crunching and looking at 
the assessor's records and such. And so I think this is one data point yeah. mm. in that whole effort. Right. Right. Yeah. But your right. like your steam and your resources could will help the ultimate goal of people implementing mm. yeah. efficiency me measures or you know air source heat pumps, <coughs> whatever the target is, which will overall help people reduce their energy use. Right. Mm. So I think it's great. Um, it, what's challenging for us is to think about this one tool is motivating people mm. yeah. where from experience it's just it's one additional you know piece of marketing and, exactly. and data point to help motivate people right with, with the other messaging that we bring exactly like your exactly. home is you know right. built before 1900 right. and it has right. you know this fuel and according to the permit records you haven't had any heating systems yeah. updated so all these things we can make assumptions about what they need mm. yeah. The, the power of this is the fact that it's a graphic image. Right. Um, we could we could spew data data points to people that would make them glaze over and put them into a coma. Yeah. You show them a picture actually, and the picture in this case actually is very you know it can be it can be pretty arresting given given the fact once you identify what's indicating the, the heat loss. Right. The graphic image is much easier to build off of as far as providing information for people who. Uh, for lay people who are really mm -hmm. just knowing that they have a high energy bill, but they don't know what to do about it. This might help them opt in. So this might yeah, be a exactly. tool that helps them say, okay, now now <coughs> you can you know contact me more specifically about my problems. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But then you have to seize that moment when people have that emotional response seeing the image. This is what right. the guy down in Pico said. Right. But then you know a week later it could just be you know in a pile of stuff over right. there. Mm -hmm. So that's why we want to work together with the towns to mm -hmm. figure out what just exactly what you said. Yeah. What would be the, the messaging and the support that people get so that you can maximize the impact of the image? Yeah. Unless you're making a choice. Go ahead. So if we're doing the bottom 25%, they're going to be 75% of people who don't get yeah. these, right. the data and the, the, the imaging. And um, I'm wondering if you've had feedback from towns or cities about that, because I can imagine that the people that might be you know, in that top 75 are the people that are most interested in having that data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do right. we manage that as a city? I mean, I'm just worried that there's going to be demand and we're going to have to say to people, oh, sorry, we don't have it for you. Well, if there's a letter, you know, 25% could get this insert in that letter, but everyone could get it. And it's, it's still an invitation to participate in our larger program. And it will be interesting to see well what yeah. who who gets this follows through and who doesn't get it follows through. Mm. It's kind of a little bit of A B testing and yeah. the effectiveness of this specific mm. tool. The other I thing still we think we're gonna be dealing with some angry or upset well, so, not so, angry but upset people. Well so, the way we you know, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I, like I was just gonna say the way we've talked about it is that we wanna be very clear in our messaging that it's a pilot study. The reason why it's only twenty five percent is it's a viability, a feasibility study. And that the Harold Rinspoon Foundation was generous enough to support this pilot study, and hopefully that, we'll do another batch, yeah. and then everybody will, you know, it, it's not that people. In Amherst, it happened. People saw it online, yeah, and they called up right away and said, "Look, if I'm not part of the 25 percent, can I still get my image?" It was like in, within two days, then yeah. six people yeah. called. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and then of course you can just explain it. Look, this is not possible this time. You know? Yeah. But, is it possible for someone to approach approach thesis and say you've got the data captured? How much would it cost to process my data? Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is not feasible. They just yeah. work in big batches. They work so in batches. Now I do a house at a time. It is a whole right. other business model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Well, if someone really wants it, we go out and scan their house. Yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. right. You can do yeah. it with the handheld thing. A dozen thing. people. Sure. That's true. Yeah. You might even have a camera like that in town, no? In the town. Um, I know I, I know infrared, infrared, I'm not sure who does a good job of infrared, mm -hmm. infrared. I mean, you guys, actually, your, your first presentation convinced me just how knowledgeable someone has to be to do mm -hmm. a good yeah, right. IR. Yeah, and these are Tell them to build a grow house, and then we could go. <laughs> 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 that's that's very right, very nice. right, right. Do, I, I just wanted to respond to one thing yeah. you said, and that is, I think it's interesting, because the way I hear a lot of what Chris has said about your previous work is a matter of using data and then the other thing is really the reports and sending them to people mm -hmm. and I, I don't necessarily think that it, it, it's not one of the same thing so to think about if that's even something you want to do I don't know if, if you want to go that route or if you just want to use it internally and overlay it with the other things you or quite frankly in my opinion the infrared image might actually be a carrot 
you know? right. come to the workshop and you'll right. get your infrared image. Right. Oh, you might get your infrared image. <laughs> 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 and, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think actually people would possibly go to the workshops just to do that. Oh, know? interesting. In my mind, I, but I'm, you, you know, work on this whole piece. I would find yeah. that, I would find that fascinating. Yeah, so. we're not marketing experts, so that's yeah. been the challenge of the, the, right. the yeah. outreach for SolarEyes the SolarEyes project is all very grassroots and yeah. so many people that come yeah. and then learn and the neighbor effect the word of mouth so yeah. by sending out anything you know it takes marketing yeah, exactly. expertise that that's what we've expensive. learned it's humbling to find but to realize that but yeah it's yeah. true and you see on the report that they've used some behavioral stuff you know comparing people to their neighbors or yeah this is O-Power's thing exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, that's like, right. yeah. it's still a, you know it's still controversial on how effective it is yeah that's interesting. From utility perspective, they get their half half percent saving by sending, you know, hundred thousand people certain report, hundred thousand people a different report, and wherever the savings are, they can claim those savings. So if the people who get one report use less energy, they can actually get, they can claim savings of stuff mm -hmm. to the to the DPU. Mm -hmm. It's this A/B testing, yeah. and it's it's worked for a company that did that. It's, it's a little, a little dicey. Yeah. Yeah. So um, time-wise, we have other stuff on the agenda that I want to get to. So uh, unless there's a really pressing question you haven't managed to ask, I think we should. Can I ask one quick one? The privacy issue. How, given the personality of Northampton, how big an issue do you think the privacy issue would be here? I think it'd be isolated. I don't think it'd be. I don't think it'd be throughout the whole community. Yeah. But I know there are a number of people who civil libertarians as it were and that would probably be nervous about yeah. it or at least on principle not, not necessarily people who are actually doing grow house or anything yeah. probably yeah. going to be a principle thing so yeah. Yeah. I'm actually curious to catch a response from the folks out here to that question does anybody think there might be an outcry for privacy on this certainly be some responses in letters and paper yes yeah, sure yeah I think there's enough of an issue that it behooves us to think about the marketing aspect yeah. Sure. Yeah. really carefully yeah. in the city. Yeah. But, uh, but I have to say that for people who actually know what thermal imaging is, yeah. um, I think those people would be so psyched. Yeah. I would be like, show me my house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and every single person who came, we had 200 people who came to the first Solarized Mass uh, meeting. I was one of the Solarized uh, trainers. Every single one of those people will show up. And they'll all want to see how great their house is now, or how much it and stinks. And those are the people yeah. that aren't going to get their. And image. those are the people who aren't going to get their. They're so interested in it, and they know that thermal imaging does not is not an X-ray of your house. Yeah, yeah. Like stuff like right. that. So that's really what needs to be yeah. put in the paper. This is not an X-ray of your house. Yeah. This is right, showing right. the leakage that you want to address. Right. Because it's leaking money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, on that note, I think we need to move on to the next. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to be continued. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we had the conversation now and so we can move faster. Thanks for the time, yeah, too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is the carbon pollution pricing resolution. Um, uh, and Alisa, since you requested that, um, do you want to just take the lead on that and just Great. Yeah, I think um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if people have concerns or questions. The one thing that, um, in my reading it yet again, that I feel like probably isn't quite strong enough, and I'm wondering if people had a similar uh, response, was actually um, either naming very specifically what we wanted to happen or what, which piece of legislation that's being, that, ha that exists already in the state house um, we might want to support or if we should leave it more conceptual and then with the, the first uh, resolve resolution um, that just kind of maps out what, what pieces we want. Yeah. So that's really the biggest question I have and I'm you know, curious to get that feedback. And essentially, I just you know I brought this forward because I wanted to see if the commission wanted to be a co-sponsor um, when we bring it to the city council next Thursday. So, Lisa, you do mention um, uh, very specific Senate acts, right? right? But just in the context of the hearings that took place. Oh yeah. So these might not even be the most current 
These actually, and that, it actually kind of explains something to me. These are not the current bills that are in front of the legislation. I think they're the same. Yeah, they changed once the legislation session ended last last December, and they started a new. There's, there are, I think there are new bills out yes. there now. Yeah. Yes. Right. So do right. I, so it might I not be the right. the correct numbers because I checked that and I thought that I got them. You, the you most might. I'm not sure. Ones. I'm not sure of the numbers, but um, yeah, I'll, I can recheck that. But I checked the current session. And And just as a little background, this is based on um, a piece that was uh, crafted in Newton. Um, I made a bunch of changes to it and, and shifted the language a little bit, but um, it is something they passed in Newton last month, or the, the kind of bare bones outline. So this has been heard by the council once already? No, um, it was introduced at the council was postponed. No, no, that was the I, I'm sorry, visa. you're right. No, I'm sorry, that was the other one. But Elisa has many resolutions, perhaps. <laughs> 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 it's right. Yeah, no, this has not no, yet been right. introduced. We hope to introduce it for its first reading on Thursday, a week from today on Thursday. April. Okay, so we wouldn't be wasting our breath with friendly amendments to it at this point. Um, no, I can make amendments to it for sure. So. Um, here's a thought. The very last whereas gets to a very concrete program suggestion, but the resolution doesn't actually include any suggested program. It just says, you know, sort of backs the concept, but I just wonder why couldn't the last whereas become part of the resolution? We are, we would support a, a fee at $10, a $10 per time. Well, that, that's actually an actionable thing. Is that going too far? Is that asking too much? I'm not sure. There are two bills. One of them's in the House and one of them's in the Senate, and they're a little bit different. So I'm not sure that they both start. They might not both start at the same place. And I know there's a third bill introduced by Solomon um, where he has a five-part bill, and carbon pollution pricing is one of the five parts, and his is a little bit different than the other. So sort of the wording of this would support any of those current efforts as opposed to something specific. And that's why I said at the beginning, you know, do we want to leave it kind of broader mm -hmm. and vaguer so that we're not tying ourselves to a particular piece of legislation? It, I don't in fact, the, the power of a resolution, of course, is, is actually stating um, the ideals as opposed to the specifics. Because resolutions don't bear the weight of law. So this is essentially a letter to the legislators who are crafting the law, um, providing support for people who, who correspond with this, and then um, hopefully expressing to people who might show opposition that there are there's community support here. So, it's a rah-rah instead of a you shall. So when we start making earmarks, it, it becomes then it becomes easier to dismiss. Uh, they say, well, we, you know, in the Senate we're negotiating something else. These guys are calling for that. Uh, You're getting in the middle of the fray. Yeah. We may be getting too granular in that respect. Okay. Yeah. So in, in in I think the police has actually done a really good job with this because it, it does express unequivocally. Our support for um, the consequences to the uses of fossil fuel, and that we it, it expresses our the, what generates our concern, and at the same time, what we would like to see the legislature do. And, and in that respect, I think because that, these resolutions, the ones when you see the ones uh, one of the resolutions where it's a, basically telling everyone we're supposed to mail something to, so the administrative assistant will be sending a copy of. Northampton's resolution to all the, basically the, um, the deliberators. So, in, in in that respect, I mean, we and Ryan's going to be introducing something here that's more specific, that's directed towards Northampton, that's more granular about goals that we um, want to achieve. So this is this is a plea to the legislature, basically. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a very strong favor course of any of those pieces of legislation. I'm happy with any I, I think any movement in that direction would certainly be improvement, yeah. 
Right, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, whichever one passes. <laughs> yeah, whatever one passes will be, yeah, will be a win. Right. Can I just, I'm the representative of Climate Action now on the state, there's a statewide coalition that's specifically for getting carbon pollution pricing legislation. It's called Massachusetts for a Clean Energy, Massachusetts Coalition for a Clean Energy Future. And there's been a lot of debate because there are people who represent different climate or, you know, groups and League of Women Voters and, and unions and business and whatever. And the coalition has pushed, we're not, we shouldn't pick and choose. We should just plain say that we are in favor of carbon pollution pricing. And that's what the coalitions that Climate Action Now belongs to, that's what the position is. And this has a little bit more information, so we're actually um, laying out some of the, the um, most basic concepts that we would like to right. see in a piece of legislation in the, that actually resonates with the two bills that had the hearings are the two bills that are Pacheco's and Barrett's and they're d dead right. because no bills have had hearings yet in the new legislative year. But cannot let people know when they do. Scott, um, this may be getting a little nitpicky, but the the resolution speaks to carbon in fossil fuels, and I'm wondering, does that exclude any action on methane releases from gas pipelines, which it, is yeah, kind of near and dear to Northampton's heart right it's now? It's not addressing that. And we actually already have passed a resolution at the city council level around right. gas leaks. Right, for uh, Council of Donald sponsored mm -hmm. us. And there's other legislation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. So there's another. We did a resolution there. relative to the gas leaks and also to uh, the moratorium. Mm -hmm. So we've we've weighed in. We made our noise about that. And we'll see what I, well, I don't know. They're supposedly going to lift the moratorium. Okay. I'm sure it had everything to do with our resolution. Okay. <laughs> I, I, and, and this wouldn't be the appropriate, I mean, I would imagine there are other communities like ours around Massachusetts that have similar gas leak problems. Would this not be a forum to voice that concern? We, you know, it's interesting uh, in in the in the public works committee meeting, and Don was there. Uh, the CEO from Columbia Gas came and was invited to come speak to all those issues and about mitigation. And right now they're in coordination for doing 250 mitigations or something about leaks in Northampton. But they're talking about doing it more throughout, at least in Columbia Gas. Um, that's just one company. That's just one small company compared to a lot of the others, so there's no, but hopefully the impetus of one company doing it might inspire other companies mm -hmm. to do it because there actually is a benefit to them that they're starting to recognize. Yeah. Louis, did you think? Oh, uh, you know, one thing that, I mean, I'd like to, I don't know how we could do it, but fit a piece in that acknowledges that this ta this tax going to have a, a greater impact on uh, people who are economically disadvantaged. I mean, the percentage of the, the tax as a percentage of their disposable income is going to be significant, and it's it's a problem with an awful lot of, uh, of uh, efforts to increase the cost of energy. Um, but could we we have it like a, maybe a, you know cognizant of the fact that blah blah blah, blah or blah, consider blah. offsets that would right. accommodate um, low income. Right. I, my understanding is that they're trying to draft a bill so that um, uh, if you okay on the other hand, uh, Louis, if you're low income, um, you're going to get the same rebate because it's a carbon fee and rebate, so yes. it comes back to you. So you're going to get the same rebate as the guy next door to you who's really high income. That person's going to be spending a lot more on fuel than you are. So you should come out better. It actually should, if anything, help low income. And on top of that, I know they're trying to look at ways to um, balance, uh, you know, if you live in Western Mass and you depend on a lot of driving, um, then that's going to get a higher rebate than if someone lives in downtown Boston. Um, so they're, they're trying to balance the rebate so for the most part, um, it's going to 
um, be equitable. To, you know, it doesn't matter how much energy you use, you're still going to get the same amount back, um, except for cases where you're forced to use more energy, and then you're going to get more to compensate for that for like driving us up. So it really should be, a, it actually should be a, a kind of a progressive tax to an extent. It's not based on consumption of fossil fuels. Um, yes, but uh, you know, if, you, if you're low income and you have a small little house, um, you know, your consumption of fossil fuels is probably far less than the wealthy person across the street who's got, you know, a heated swimming pool and, and two, they, two SUVs. Unless you could also have a LEED certified building that-, that That's true. Zero, you know. That's true, right. So yeah. they can afford well, anyway, so Chairman, yeah. Chairman's right. Well, yeah. um, one difference between the two main bills is that the House version um, is not 100% revenue neutral, and 20% of the money would be kept for green infrastructure directed primarily towards uh, communities in, of greater need. And um, people from uh, from Arise for Social Justice, talked with people, Mark Breslow, who wrote both of those bills, talked with people from Climate Action Now, I mean from uh, Arise for Social Justice, and at their annual meeting in January, they voted unanimously to support the idea, no matter which bill actually passed. So it, it, to Louis's point, I don't think it's a bad idea to include that in the, and the, therefore yeah. be a result that uh, to consider offsets to accommodate people. I actually had initially had language that addressed the issue that you're bringing up, and I just couldn't figure out how to mm -hmm. do it elegantly, and I ended up just kind of leaving it out. But yeah, maybe I should. I can tell you the bills, the bills themselves have the language. Right. Yeah, well, they worked really the, hard on it. In the resolution, we want to support that attitude and also yeah. support, yeah. So if, if we can have it, therefore, be a result yeah. that the city of Northampton also calls for um, economic offsets for people in need, so something blah, blah, blah. Okay, thank you. Just um, uh, because of time, uh, I'm wondering if the commission's at a point where someone wants to move to resolve to co-sponsor this. I, I move that we co-sponsor. Okay, Bill's moving to we co-sponsor. Second. Okay. Is, um, is any, do we need more discussion? Are we ready to vote? Looks like all in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Ryan, we got to yours. <laughs> So, um, uh, uh, so the last topic on the agenda is uh, energy conservation goals, um, a resolution aimed towards that, and uh, this is something that was requested by Ryan, um, yeah. uh, Councillor O'Donnell. Um, so, okay, yep. Apologize for wearing a tie with jeans, by the way. Oh, <laughs> oh so okay, yeah, try to get better. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Lose the tie. Exactly. <laughs> Don't lose the jeans. <laughs> Not now. Yeah, we would think that Brian we would know it if he hadn't said something because we can't even see it. <laughs> that concludes my presentation. <laughs> um, well, for, can I just talk very briefly as a way to introduce this item um, by talking about the last one just very briefly. Thank you to Councilor Clant for doing that. Um, uh, Councilor Dwight and I started to talk about the issue I'm going to describe and then it was kind of revealed that Councilor Clant had already um, shown leadership leadership on the other issues, so I'm, I'm glad that's going forward with your uh, sponsorship and recommendation. The issue I wanted to raise was more uh, directly about um, supporting state legislation and, and setting local goals in terms of ratcheting up the amount of energy that comes from renewable sources. Um, there's a piece of state legislation uh, entitled an act transitioning Massachusetts to 100% renewable energy, and this essentially ratchets up the what, uh, what the, the share of the, uh, the renewable energy portfolio that uh, utilities have to get from renewable sources, and it ratchets it up annually so that 100% um, um, of renewable energy production 
um, is met by 2035, and I think for certain sectors like heating, it's, it's a little bit later. And that's just the requirement you're putting on the utility. So originally I thought this might go well with that resolution, but since that resolution is ready to go, I hate to encumber it with, uh, with more whereases and, and make it more complicated. But I do think this is an interesting issue for the city to consider. Um, that's the state angle. The local angle is what are, what are our goals as a city? Um, I went back to the 2008 Sustainable Northampton Plan, and in it it says there is a goal of a total of 25% energy demand supplied from renewable sources by 2017 um, based on payments on energy bills. So this is 2017. It's for the municipal government only, I believe. Correct. Thank you. So that's an important distinction. Now I'm talking about what our commitment, our commitment is as a city. So one question I had, maybe, um, maybe uh, Mr. Mason knows, is have we met that goal? And if not, is it time to reconsider the goal? If we have, is it time to set a new one? And I'll note that, just to provide some information, uh, other cities have started to do this. Burlington, uh, Vermont, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, I believe have set goals for 100% renewable um, energy by certain dates. Um, uh, state of California set a 50% goal, and I understand the state of Hawaii was the first state to set a 100% goal. And so they are just goals, but it seems to me that we probably will be looking again at the Sustainable Northampton Plan um, on its anniversary. And so this commission would play an important role in, in discussing those issues, and that's kind of discussion that I wanted to have you far more expertise than I do, so I would, I would welcome your comments. So Chris, how um, do, where are we on the goals of the municipal? Right, sure. Uh, so um, uh, when, uh, um, when Councilor O'Donnell brought this up, uh, I did contact Wayne, who happens to be happily on a fellowship in Italy. <laughs> Sucks for him. I know, totally. <laughs> it, was, it was really disappointing to actually talk to him by email. It's, <laughs> anyhow, but anyhow, um, uh, so the 25% renewable energy, um, which I believe uh, pertain to just for electric um, in, in the sustainable North Tampa plan. No, we haven't. Um, it would be as easy as saying next time we purchase electricity, we need to have at least 25% of it be in renewable, um, um, which means that we would then be buying uh, renewable energy credits put off by someone else. Um, and that probably would have a, um, but uh, so, you know, if the city wanted to say, this is a policy we've set and we haven't achieved it yet, we need to achieve it. It's a fairly easy thing to do. It would just cost the city a little bit of extra money. I'm not sure how much, but it would just, next time we go out for uh, purchase electricity, we would purchase 25% uh, or more renewable energy. Um, so that could be done. I'm not sure if it's the most effective way to, um, make change, um, one could argue one, one way or the other. Um, and the Sustainable Northampton Plan is um, uh, already being looked at to be revamped, so Wayne's office is already working on that. And um, I know they're aiming to um, put in there the same goals the state has for greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, so that would be, what is it, 50% by, uh, I forgot how that. No, 20% 20, 20 by 2050 80%. and... 80%. What is it? 80% by 2050. 80% by... 2050. By 2050, is that it? Okay, right. And uh, there's a lower goal as well. So so they are looking at doing that. And Wayne, um, to, you know, wonderfully, really wants this not to be just a goal, but to, like the state did, really identify the sectors and the policies that will get you there, um, which would be quite a bit of work to try to identify, you know, really lay out kind of a map, like, as the state has done. It's not meeting its goals at the moment either. Um, but at least it really has a very targeted direction. So I know that's the direction the um, planning department is going in. Um, I don't know exactly where it is, and Wayne's not here to speak to it um, in himself. Do you have a sense of the percentages, though, that currently exist for renewables? Renewables, um, because of the renewable portfolio standard, um, electricity, I think we, uh, I think everybody, everybody is buying currently about 15% renewable energy. I think that's where it stands right now. Won't that change once the landfill array is completed? Um, 
No. <laughs> um, because we will be buying net metering credits. Right. Right. Um, but the thing, the, what the landfill will produce, that is the basically the societal benefit, is sold as, this, as the SREX. Yeah. And Amoresco is going to sell the SREX. So now that's where, if we were to buy green electricity, we would be buying someone else's RECs. Now, so SREX are very, very expensive. Rex, which would be like a wind turbine someplace or hydro that's been, you know, hy hydro that's been running for the last hundred years, you can still can produce Rex. And we would buy those Rex, which means that we then have the right to say that we are using that for green electricity. Um, uh, and you're right, more, and, and, and the more people buy these Rex, the more it'll cause their price to go up and the more of a demand there is for people to actually produce them. So, you know, as the, as the price keeps going up, then developers say, wow, I can get more money by selling Rex. They're more likely to, uh, to put in renewable energy. That's, that's the whole premise behind selling the, um, the societal benefits. Um, there's a way that helps developers pay for their projects and people who want to, um, you know, incentivize the developers to pay for the projects to buy these. Um, so the renewable portfolio standard goes up 1% per year, and I think it's at around 15% right now. Um, and most part, like the Amoresco project will probably almost certainly be sold to utilities. So the Amoresco project will then feed into that next 1%. But it'll be part of that inventory. Right, it'll just keep, exactly, it's gonna keep building up. But um, then is there a way, and I don't wanna fudge this, but is there a way that we can incorporate that in, in our in our contribution to offsets um, that, would, that doesn't necessarily, we're consuming uh, 20% or make, make the, meet the sustainable Northampton goal, but the fact is we're also at the same time um, yeah, contributing to it. I mean, essentially programs that, uh, instituting programs that contribute to uh, renewable offsets. I don't know, but, but, and I think is Ryan's talking here, we're trying to find reasonable, approachable, accessible goals that aren't pie in the sky, but what, as you said, that are more targeted, that actually achievable, aggressively achievable, as opposed to feel good achievable. Mm -hmm. And so this is what he, he's trying to craft here is, uh, is, is essentially a blueprint, objectives and motivation. So to, when, when other counselors or other, uh, other energy officers are in the future, looking back to see what it was, what our original intent was, you know, how, how are we abiding by the spirit of this? So in that respect, I mean, I think what we need from this committee is, is some sense of what's the best way to approach this? I mean, should we set, I mean, I mean if we say, yeah, we, by uh, 2025, we're gonna be 100%, that's, that's a really nice thing that we can go out and brag about and say that we said, but it's, it's, it's a ludicrous aspiration, at least given what we know now. So what what can we do, or what should we do? You know, I'll go I'll go from uh, kind of from a totally different direction. Cambridge has put together a plan to become net zero. Um, um, the municipality, no, the city, the whole city, the whole city, and they paid an enormous amount of money to kind of do this planning, and they they, they and they have really mapped out a, a huge planning piece on how to get there, and they weren't able to get there. They were able to get to like 80 percent reduction and so their plan basically says we're going to get you know at this point when we're going to be closer to that 80 percent we replan to try to get the last 20 percent so you know even though they couldn't identify the last bit they put in place a plan so that they would continue to to follow that um, <coughs> and the, what i've heard from cambridge is, is as that conversation happened the shift from 50%, 70%, whatever, to net zero, changed the conversation. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, people just look at this totally different. Right. It's no longer trying to get part way. All of a sudden, whoa, no greenhouse gas emissions, no fossil fuel abuse. It, it really changed, and then so, I'm part of a group of um, uh, sustainability, of, uh, municipal sustainability folks from around New England, and Cambridge is part of that group too, and I've heard them report back on their process, um, and that was one of the things that came out. You know, that it's kind of a game changer to really s to put the stake in the ground and say this is a whole new concept. This, you know, 
So all of a sudden, and, and Cambridge had businesses involved, um, uh, you know, government, they had, they, they had a huge amount of stakeholders involved, and they, they put it in place. So it is, you know, I think the effort of setting a really solid goal with a lot of stakeholder input um, uh, is an important, is a very important piece to do. If you can do that, you've got a lot of people, you know, all different sectors moving in the right direction. Is that a realistic <clears throat> process to start in the city of Northampton? Or at least to start bringing the stakeholders together? I don't know who would be among the stakeholders. Right. Um, I'm well, not sure if I can answer that. Cam Cambridge has a few uh, nonprofit institutions that, uh, uh. one of them that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 and we have a nonprofit institution. And in fact, someone associated with the engineering department here is in the room. And I won't identify them, but the the fact is that there seems to, that um, there should be some larger conversations with the larger institutional systems here that would. And, and at least I, I jumped over you. So. No, I just had a question for you, Councillor. Is it is the intention here to um, start talking about the the renewed um, sustainable Northampton plan? Is the intention to create some kind of order or legislation? I mean, what's your kind of end goal, or is it to create a community conversation and create? series of charrettes or something like that. I mean, what, what did you have in mind coming here? Well, originally I thought that the state legislation uh, requiring greater and greater percentages of energy in certain sectors, up to 100 by a certain year, would be good legislation for this commission to support through a resolution. And I would think it would actually go well um, with the carbon tax, which is, you know, carbon tax is a more elegant solution in a sense. Um, I don't know if they're mutually exclusive, though. No. Um, so maybe yours is more of a carrot. Um, and this is more just kind of punitive. Um, so that was my original thought. And then I thought, well, if that's the case for the state, what, what's our own, what are our own goals? Um, and we couldn't create a, a, an ordinance that would do the same thing for the private sector in the city. But as Chris points out, um, there are local municipal goals that we could meet. And so that's when I looked at the Sustainable Northampton plan and saw the 25% figure, and I was surprised. Um, and I just was curious if we had met that. At this point, um, you know, I don't necessarily feel that we need to rush to support um, another good piece of legislation, but I do like the idea of having um, conversations about what Northampton could do, maybe in line with what Cambridge did, that would be meaningful. Um, I think I think you know ambitious goals are, are good, even if we don't quite know how to achieve achieve them. But I don't think we want to cross the line into doing something that's just for show. Um, so maybe it's a long way of saying I don't know exactly, but I do think it's an important uh, discussion for the city to have. Would you want me to reach out to Cambridge? And maybe bring, see if we can bring someone in from Cambridge to talk with us. Um, and would it be at a commission meeting, or would you want to sit down and talk to some of the planners in Cambridge? We could. I don't know if we need to you know, haul them across the across the or state. Maybe at this point, but, but, um, <laughs> well, I think it would be it would be good to explore more what Cambridge. I don't really understand um, as, I, as in the detail you do what they do. So it would and, be good to research from them. And I don't have it in depth either. Okay. So that's why I'm thinking actually yeah. talking to someone from Cambridge. Uh, and I have a person in mind who would probably be really, really very open to it. Well, if you're looking for kind of an action item to close the discussion today, I think that would be, that would be a good step. Okay. I would appreciate it. Okay. At least have a conversation with yeah, you. Yeah, have a conversation. And, and then see where we go. Okay. Yeah, One more you. action item I'd suggest is just to get to your uh, question about where we are against the 25%. Could we put the RECs aside because that, after all, is just a sort of a societal accounting mechanism. Mm -hmm. And if you add up all of the renewable generation we have today, add in the landfill to come, put that over the town's kilowatt hour usage. If you, if you wanted to basically say, we developed the, the landfill project and- um, Including the methane digester. And, and the methane digester. If you, if you basically want to say, you know, we should be able to take credit for that. And the Smith vote. Right. Array. And the Smith Book Array. Well, Smith Book Array is really quite small um, uh, compared to landfill. But 
Uh, is big, the landfill one is a big one. Uh, the landfill one is going to cover about uh, 40, 45 percent of our electricity use. Um, okay. Right. So, um, I mean, it's gonna we're gonna Practical. get the goal. <laughs> we're gonna get net metering credits that cover about 40 about 40 percent of our electric so per, Well, I, I'm not even sure I'm I'm being entirely semantic here. The, the sustainable Northampton plan simply says generate X percent of our usage with renewable sources. What does it? I, I'm guessing it does. I, I don't. I don't even think it was written in the days when Rex were. Right. Uh, Rex didn't exist. Yeah. Do you want to know what it says? It says a total of 25 percent energy demand supplied from renewable sources by 2017, based on payments on energy bills. Yeah. So I don't know. There's a bit of a problem with demand and pain. Right. 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 <laughs> and because you know. Not you, much though. You, you don't. You, you will never. The, the electrons that come out of the, the, the array at the landfill may never reach any of our buildings. Right. They right. might. They might not. Though. Right. Right. Well, but we did generate. I mean, Scott asked the same question I did, more a lot more elegantly, and really clear. Clear. <laughs> And so that that's true. I, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I and I certainly don't want to. Look, I, I don't think we should look upon our fifty percent as being some aspect of failure in relation to the sustainable Northampton plan. I think. Right. To Scott's point, that our contribution has been it should should we should get some aspect of credit for that as well. Right. So, and and the solar rise program. And the solar rise program. Um, yes, that tripled program. the amount of solar on uh, residential houses yeah. in North Hampton. So mm -hmm. um, there's certainly. I mean, that's why kind of why I'm saying again, we could buy Rex, and I'm not sure that's the best thing to do. I actually think the solar rise program and putting in our own PV array in the landfill, those are actually more effective because you know we really are. Um, putting time and effort in there to get something boosted. Um, uh, but it, it's kind of semantics, right? It's, 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 well, well, we should track both. And, yeah. okay. and in fact, actually, when we do our next sustainable plan, that, that we, can, we know how different dimensions that we can, and different uh, you know, uh, landmarks that we can actually describe than we had before. So it would be more precise. If you wanted to uh, make uh, Councillor Klein's resolution a little more granular um, or problematic, you could always ask that some of the um, money that you got from a carbon tax be given back to cities and towns uh, to allow them to add infrastructure to reduce their uh, what they spend on energy. So. Look, and that's what the not car the not revenue neutral one does. It's not quite. New revenue, right, right. 90%. And just to let you, the uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative, which basically put a carbon tax on our electricity throughout the Northeast and then other states, that money feeds into the Green Communities Program. So it's actually doing that right now. The grants that we get from the Green Communities Program is basically paid for by a carbon tax, mm -hmm. yeah. which is nice. Mm -hmm. So it's a good model. Nice, but not enough. Not enough, no. <laughs> I will thank you very much for your thank time. You. Okay. So, Chris, I I gotta go. Yeah, I think we're, I, we're done. At the end, we're at the end of the agenda. Actually, that was, that was pretty. I good. move that we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>